take a sec. Okay. Okay. Whenever yep. you're good. Hello and welcome to Progressive Mindset. I'm Bradley Monday, and today we are going to be discussing building your personal brand, why it's important and, and why you need to get started today if you haven't already. Um, definitely a, a point that I'm not very good at is, uh, is building your personal brand. So um, I'm joined today. I'm really excited about this because I'm hoping to learn a lot. I'm joined today by two of the kingpins um, of personal brand from, from my space, from the managed service provider space. So I'm joined here uh, by Mr. Richard Tubb himself. Hello, how you doing? Uh, and also uh, familiar face on the podcast, uh, usual co-host, Mr. Jason Kemsley. Hello, I'm a little bit nervous about this. Uh, I'm not sure what it feels like to necessarily be on the other side of, of something you've spoken on for so long, but let's give it a go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, now, because this, uh, because this podcast goes out a little bit wider than um, uh, the MSP audience that I think you're both, um, you know, frequent, uh, frequently members of uh, different podcasts in. Uh, it'd be good to start with just a couple of minutes. Um, let's get some backstory on you, on you guys, um, where you started, um, where you are now, uh, and then we'll get into um, how you built your personal brand. So, um, Richard, as the I consider you the OG in our space <laughs> of, of personal brand, definitely. <laughs> Definitely in the UK, right? One of the first people that I saw going, hey, I've done the MSP thing. I've, I've been successful at that, sold that. And now um, you know, pretty much rely on your personal brand to put, to put food on the table, right? It's, um, <laughs> yes. so, so talk, us through, talk us through the journey. Yeah, so really briefly, um, so I'm Richard Tubb, based in Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England. But astute listeners will hear that my accent is actually Birmingham based. I'm a Brummie, so Peaky Blinders and all that stuff. But I moved up to Newcastle six years ago. And my background is I used to run a managed service provider business, an IT support business based out of Birmingham. Sold that business about 12 years ago. And now I'm an author, speaker, writer within the IT managed service provider space. And I think the link to the uh, personal brand side of things is my, my story is that I started blogging 20 odd years ago now. So there's like five odd thousand blog posts out there. And, and when I started blogging, Brad, I didn't do it because I wanted to build a personal brand. I did it because like you two, I like sharing my advice, my knowledge with other people. But then what happened when I sold the MSP business, you know, so I've been blogging for a few years, suddenly other MSPs started getting in touch with me and saying, now that you're no longer a competitor, <laughs> would you come in and do some work with us? Now, I'd love to say I set out to do that as like some grand plan. I, I didn't at all. I didn't have the, the vision okay. to do that. But so I've become an accidental sort of um, personal brand uh, ambassador here, um, you know, and, and now I'm writing books. And I've got my own my own podcast called Tub Talk, the podcast for IT consultants and YouTube videos. And uh, you, people will be sick to death of me because they see me everywhere. Um, <laughs> but it all started out from an accident. It literally was born from a place of I just wanted to share what was in my mind, what was working for me running a business, what wasn't working for me. So not dissimilar to what you're doing with the podcast here. So you said earlier on, you know, personal brands, uh, you know, it's something I struggle with. You're already building a personal brand, whether you know it or not, Brad. Oh, I, I, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get it. I've got a question that there's one thing that really um, gets me stuck at putting myself out there more. And uh, I'm, I've got a question on it later. Um, Jason, so you've, um, I think it would be fair to say you've exploded on in our space in, in recent years. And I think your journey to, to sort of having and building a personal brand has been possibly more pur purposeful than, um, than Richard mentioned there. His happened by accident. With, let's, let's, talk, let's go through your backstory um, and talk about how you came to be. Uh, um, at, uh, yeah. oh, it's very kind because uh, I suspect Richard is the same, but I don't, I don't feel like I've created a brand, if, uh, so to speak. Um, so it, it's kind to hear that it merits that sort of thought. So thank you. Um, my my story is not as beautiful as Richard's. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have a you know a good success that that led me necessarily onto it. I think uh, my story came from. Uh, I guess that my roots are starting from the the ground up, and I know everyone has, but um, seeing everything. 
definitely reaching a certain point of showing um, success in some form, whether that's number of people, size of business, whatever that is. Um, and then obviously we as a business reached a certain point where we needed someone to go and take the brand further. Um, and it just so happened that naturally my skill set or my gift of the gab, as some people would say, um, lended itself well to that. So I, I definitely resonate significantly with Richard, which is, you know, I've been mastering my trade in the background and didn't mean to become known. I meant to push the brand forward. And as such, you also become known as part of the, the so. journey. And I focused on the the value and what I was trying to provide. And it's it's led me to this point, which are obviously incredibly grateful for gets cool people like Richard and yourself friends. So fantastic. Okay, perfect. So, um, uh, because I, I need to take away some good value from here. Let's start off with some questions that I wanted to ask. Um, so my, my first question is how, how do we get started? So, um, obviously the, definitely, I think the, the space has changed in terms of building your personal brand. People are so more, acutely aware that building personal brand is a, is a great way to get your product sold, sell other people's products even. Um, you know, it's a great way to generate revenue. Um, let's, let's talk a bit about getting started. If you had to choose, you know, just a couple of things that you would focus on if you're doing it again now, starting from scratch, where would you be focused um, on? Is it a particular platform, that sort of stuff? Uh, Richard, if you'd like to take that first, please. I find it really interesting when it comes to personal brands. People uh, historically think of personal brands as being like, I don't know, George Foreman and he's parlaying a boxing career into grills and things like that. It's not. People do business with people they know, like and trust. So a personal brand has always been and I think always will be just putting your personality out there so people can get to know you get to like you, get to trust you, hopefully, and then they'll want to do business with you. So something you said really struck a chord to me. So this is a, you know, a direct tip for you here, Brad, and for anybody listening, thinking, where do I get started? You have got started. Uh, one of the secrets that I'll share with the audience now about my podcast is I used to record, I, sorry, let me rewind. I used to sit down and have conversations when I was starting out in the MS, uh, IT industry and I used to sit down with some of the smartest, most successful and giving people within our industry, real sort of captains of industry. And they used to share freely of their time and experience with me. And I'm pretty sure Jason and yourself have found, you know, that, that same sort of uh, course as well. After a while, what I realized was I'd come away from those conversations and I'd think, man, that was gold. I wish I'd have recorded that and shared it, not only for my own records, but with other people as well. So I started doing that. And that's where Tub Talk, my podcast, came from. It's literally allowing other people to eavesdrop in a really polite way on my conversations with, you know, captains of industry, the great, the good, the interesting. You've already started down that road, haven't you? So for anybody, you know, listening today and thinking, where do I start? Podcasts are a really great way of reaching out to people that you respect, that you find interesting, that you want to personally learn from. And if you record those conversations, you know, absolutely other people are going to want to eavesdrop or going to want to learn the same things that you do. So for me, if I was starting out, I would start at exactly the same way and exactly the way that you guys are, which is I would interview people that I find interesting. I would have mm -hmm. conversations that other people are going to find interesting. I would seek out virtual mentors, uh, successful people, and I'd ask them the questions that I want answered. Now, Again, the secret I'll share here is I, I've interviewed millionaires, billionaires, you know, some of the top people in the MSP space. I'm thinking if I'd approach them as Richard Tubb, the, the brummy, the bald headed brummy from Birmingham with a cheeky smile and said, oh, can I can I pick your brains about this? They may have said yes, because as, as I found out, people are very giving with their time and experience, but they might not have been compelled to do that. Because, you know, how many times do we three get people getting in touch saying, hey, can I pick your brains? You know, and sometimes you become immune to that. But if you say, can I interview you for my podcast? I'm a big admirer. and I'd like to ask you some questions. Most people in the IT space, and I find most entrepreneurs full stop, want to help people. And that instinct to share your knowledge with others never goes away. So 
to get long answer to a short question here, Brad, but to get started, I would definitely do what you're doing here. And I would seek out conversations, interviews with people that I admire, people that are smart, people that I personally want to learn from, because if I want to learn from them, other people will as well. So I think you're, you're already on the road again. Fantastic. OK, uh, Jason, what about yourself um, on that question? My, I'll possibly take it a little bit earlier. And uh, Brad, you obviously add some some credit into this scenario. But um, I think this this is a longevity game. Richard, you've had you know fantastic longevity in this space. And I think the first thing you have to do is nail the product or service that you are involved with prior to focusing on yourself and your personal brand. I see so many people trying to create a personal brand using a brand new product that has or service that is not really anywhere near good enough for them to retain retention of views or retention of people wanting to talk about it. Building a personal brand brand is as much about other people talking about you as it is you talking about you. And so, you know, one of the things I think we we done really well as a brand was nailed what we were doing before we tried to become known because it meant the message then resonated and hopefully will continue to resonate for quite a long time because we've nailed what we're we're talking about um there's obviously great success in um going out and getting known if you look at any of the really popular and i know it's slightly off topic but the influences in the world they have to have a good product or service or they're an overnight success but with no longevity so um i think if you're thinking about building your personal brand Obviously, it's never going to be a hundred percent, but get your product or service to a point where you're proud of it. Obviously, realizing perfection is never possible, <laughs> and then go focus on the you know what Rich is talking about. Do a podcast, speak to the really uh, high influential people in your space, the people that are giving. Um, and there are trade associations in every industry. There are organisations you can get involved with and give up your time. Um, in ours, we have CompTIA. That was a huge part of me putting my name out there and giving back some time to try and help. If you're in the accountancy industry, there must be a similar, and I don't know them off the top of my head, but um, if if you want to do it for the right reasons, I believe the right results will come back to you. If you are forcing the message because you are doing it with the sole intention of selling and pushing, uh, I, I do believe you'll have a personal brand, but for a very short period of time. Okay. Um, so you you talk a little bit about there, Jason, about being um, in uh, different groups and that sort of stuff. Um, obviously, I've been able to to follow your journey quite closely, uh, and I think being in those groups has probably been the basis of before you put yourself on the on the web, as it were, through the various different forums and and podcasts, etc. You definitely built quite um, quite good rapport with your with your peers in, in your space. Uh, Richard, would you have said that that came for you quite early on or yeah. was that a secondary thing to? No, I, I, I'm really intrigued by what Jason said, because I think you two and the team at Uptime Solutions, the reason that you've built, and Jason, I would say the reason that you built this wonderful personal brand that you've got in like, a, I was going to say super quick time, but you, you've already done it over a consistent period is for two reasons. One, you are very open and honest and you, you know, people like you uh, because you share, you know, you're no flim flam. People know that they can trust you going back to that no like and trust. Uh, but secondly, you have got a great product and you have got that damn pat. What I would say though, for anybody listening to this who perhaps doesn't have the product yet, you can't build a personal brand to cover for not having a great product. You know, in fact, it will pollute your personal brand. But what you can do is allow people to see uh, openly your journey as you are building that product. And there's some great examples within our industry of people who are, are doing that. Um, a company that we know in the IT space called SuperOps. Uh, you know, they're a startup out of uh, India doing great work and uh, they're sharing what they're doing as they're going along. So, you know, uh, and people are getting to know them really, really well. And I think you did that to a degree with Uptime Solutions. I remember saying to both of you, you should have founders diaries and, you know, put what you're doing out there because people want to know you. And it all comes back to that know, like and trust. With that said, your question, Brad, was about, you know, getting out there. 
Uh, absolutely. When I was running my MSP business, you know, I used to go out to networking events. Uh, I used to go to peer groups. I used to go to conferences. Um, but again, it's exactly the same as we've just talked about. When I was there, I wasn't out there being that networking bulldog, shoving business cards in people's faces and sell, sell, sell to them. I was doing what you and Jason have done at, where every time I've observed you at these type of events. I was looking to add value to the relationship. And even if I couldn't add value directly, I was what Bob Bo Bo Bob Berg, put my teeth back in, uh, author of The Go-Giver calls, uh, being the connector. So I've seen you do it, Jason. You've you've turned down opportunities to do business with people in a very polite and respectful way. But you've actually said, let me introduce you to X, Y or Z who can do a better job for you. So in answer to your question, Brad, absolutely. You know, you build your personal brand, but you can still add value in person when you're out there. You don't have to be stood with a, a loud hailer sort of bellowing out. Hey, look at me. I've got a personal brand. Your personal brand is how you behave how you add value to other people and how you consistently do that over time. So I think hopefully I'm agreeing with what Jason said and maybe adding on to the top of it. So. Absolutely. So authenticity tends to, seems to be uh, definitely running a running theme yes. here. Um, Absolutely. I, I, I complete, sorry, Brad, to interject in the intent of what you're trying to do is um, we spoke about this on a, an earlier podcast Um and I said, you know, my goal is to treat everyone in such a way that regardless of whether or not we work together, we can have a beer at the bar the next time we see each other at a corporate event or whatever it is that may be. And even if that is a customer you once worked with, you now don't work with, you know, these things happen sometimes. Um, it could be because they've moved on, whatever the reason. Um, if, you, if you've got the right intent, what you're going to get is that longevity. It goes back to, you know, we talk a lot in business about, hey, if you don't lose a customer, it's almost sometimes as good as, as gaining one because otherwise you're, you're fulfilling that cycle of lose, replace, lose, replace, and you don't grow. It's, it's the same in the personal brand world. For every person that thinks I'm an idiot, they're going to tell five people and I lose as much credit as what I do build over here. So trying to keep that intent is, is just as important in personal brand for me as, as it is in business. Perfect. Um, right. Let's get into, um, you've talked about being in a room and talking and networking and doing all of these things. So we're going to get into a bit of yeah, Bradley Monday counseling session, I think here. Um, <laughs> one, of, one of the struggles that I have, and I think this is definitely going to be resonated um, with uh, entrepreneurs that maybe they have created a product um, or created a service, whatever that might be. They're not the, that the, on the sales end um, is, it's all very well turning up to the event uh, with lots of value and lots of things to give. Do you both consider yourselves um, outgoing? Have you always been outgoing? Or has this been something that you've, you've learned uh, along the way? Uh, if, I, if I may, just because uh, something's come to mind. I, I think it's a, I, I know where you're probably going to take this question if I know you well enough, and I will come back to answer it. Um, it's about having an, so I, I'm involved in lots of things and lots of introverted people I speak with. They don't want to have a conversation for the sake of having a conversation or they don't want to do small talk or they don't want to walk up to someone and network. The interactions you don't think hold any value are the ones that hold the most value. So whether you're in introvert, extrovert, it's about understanding that any interaction, and it could be I join a call uh, I'm part of a trade association in our group. It could be I join a call. I don't feel like I have a, add a huge amount of value. I don't add a huge amount of in input. That was super valuable in terms of me staying out there. So I'm still giving time, I'm still giving energy. I'm still giving mind space. Um, so I'm an, I think I'm an introvert and extrovert. I, I've become very good at... Uh, forcing my extrovert side out because okay. i've i've convinced myself and i genuinely believe this as well that value comes mostly from the conversations that i don't typically believe have value something i really struggle with personally and i don't want to switch this to my counseling session <laughs> is, I, is I, I struggle having small talk i struggle with the stuff that you know really doesn't mean anything that hi how are you the general sort of chit chat i sometimes struggle with that 
And I've had to learn over time that that's the stuff that really creates a cool, good, strong relationship. And so I've had to repeat that and, and you know, really start to believe it and realize and put it into practice. That it's the stuff I always thought being an introvert originally didn't matter, really does matter. And it's allowed me to really come out of my shell and I think turn into an extrovert to answer your question at the end there. Okay. So you are, to summarize, you are introvert turned turned extrovert. It's something you managed to coach within, within Absolutely. yourself. Absolutely. If I could choose to, I would sit in a room on my own doing my own thing. Um, that's where I feel I'm super comfortable in my own uh, in my own self or, you know, being alone, that's when I'm most comfortable. Okay. I, you know, I get a little bit of the nerves and stuff or a bit of anxiousness before I go into an event because you don't quite know what it holds. But then once I'm there and I realize how hey, you're here, let's make the absolute most of it. And that's, that's self-awareness stuff that I've worked on over years, but it, it makes people think I'm an extrovert. And I don't think I actually am, to be honest, but stereotypically I could be considered it. Okay. Um, before Richard, before we move on to you, I just want to delve into that with uh, with Jason. Just to, just for a second, you you talk about coaching and working on yourself over the, over time. Is that something that you've done with with a mentor, or what's the what does that coaching look like? Uh, it by and large, uh, probably partly yourself. I think business partnerships go a long way to pushing that um, being held accountable and growth. I don't know if it's necessarily the right thing for you to realize what you want to work on or whatever but there's definitely someone to hold you accountable so you can keep progressing um and then the majority the majority of the self-awareness has come from you know people like richard or other industry folks or the therapist i work with but that's that's not as long term um just picking out how you could do this that would be quite cool um so i i done exactly what richard described and i surrounded myself with I made myself the dumbest person in the room, um, quite literally, and sometimes feel like that. So I need to work on that bit at some point. <laughs> but um, these people drove me to success uh, in some way, shape or form because they pushed me. Thanks for that, Jason. Um, Richard, let, over to you then. Um, are you naturally ex extroverted? Tell us about I that. I so associate with what Jason just said there. So I would say that, yeah, I'm probably naturally extroverted, but I don't believe anybody is fully extrovert or introvert. And, and Jason, I've heard people talk about this. I think it's omnivert or something in the middle. People say, oh, I, I genuinely don't believe that anybody is one or the other. I think so. For instance, I am an extrovert. You know, I, I, I like being the center of attention. I like talking. I like meeting new people up to a point and then I've had too much and I need to go away and lie in a darkened room. And the other thing, <laughs> you know, just to recover, but the opposite end of the scale, it, and I'm realizing as we're talking now and Jason, you know, I learn as much from, um, from you as, as, as hopefully I share with you. Um, something you said, you know, how uh, you, you need to, it, it becomes scary for you to walk into a room and being full of people and all the rest of it. What you're actually doing, I think, is using energy to push yourself forward there. So it's actually outside your so-called comfort zone or your natural zone, and you're using energy. What I've realized on the opposite end of the scale is I draw energy from being with people, but there's a finite amount of energy that I can draw for them. And the opposite end of the scale is if I don't spend time around people, if I stay in that dark room on my own for too long, I get drained as well. So there's a happy medium for me. And, and again, I'll share with you, you two have probably seen this when I've been at events, IT events, because I'm a personal brand, you know, I'm in that fortunate position where a lot of people know me. And thankfully, a lot of people seem to like me and want to spend time with me, which is great really good for my ego and everything else. But there comes a point, usually at the end of the event, especially if I've been talking, and you can see, not that my eyes are glazing over, but maybe I'll make contact with, I'll make eye contact with you, uh, Brad, or you, Jason, and go, I, I just want to spend time around friends now where I can just not be myself, but I don't have to be worrying about the personal brand. I can just be myself. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, so extrovert, you know, introverts, there's some of that in all of us. You've got to get that balance right. And what I've started to do now when I go to events is, and again, it comes down to that, that self-awareness that you talked about, Jason. 
I now build in blocks of time where I can just have a little bit of time on my own to recover. Sometimes I never thought a younger Richard would never believe that the current Richard would say this, but I skip parties. Uh, you know, I've done that time and I can go and just get some room service in the home te- in the hotel room and just chill out. Or the other thing that I do is I make time, uh, I make plans in advance to spend time with people that I consider good friends like yourselves. And that way we can get away from the maddening crowds and maybe go off, you know, for a meal on our own or a drink on our own or whatever. Uh, and so for me, that's a big part of the self-awareness of realizing, yeah, you can keep going, 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 but then you're going to have an almighty come down afterwards. Wouldn't it be better to balance that against, you know, topping up your energy uh, and then retreating when you need to? I'll say one other thing on this. What you said, Jason, and what you said, Brad, about, you know, networking maybe not being a natural thing. It's absolutely, even for me as an extrovert, my idea of hell is walking into a room full of strangers and realizing that I've got to go and talk to strangers and put on, you know, the the best version of myself for other people. And the, the way I overcame that was by realizing that lots and lots of other people are feeling exactly the same way. And so if I could go into that room and help other people by putting them at ease, by connecting them to other people, again, coming back to by adding value, uh, I enjoyed the events a lot more. And secondly, knowing when enough was enough. So when I used to get to uh, um, networking, business networking events as an MSP, I'd say to myself, right, I'm going to speak to three new people. Don't have to be customers. In fact, they're probably not going to be, but I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to add value. I'm hopefully going to connect them with somebody else. And then if I'm tired, I'm going to call it a day and I'm going to retreat. And so that's how I started, you know, becoming more comfortable with networking. But even as an extrovert, like you guys, walking into a room full of people, I'm like, oh, I just want to stand in the corner on my mobile phone and pretend I'm really important. So, yeah. <laughs> Brad, if I can just add something to that, because I, I think Richard okay. hit the nail on the head. I think there's a common misconception that quantity is so important. It is definitely still in this quality over quantity. Um, I learned this very early on. I thought I had to be in going back to events, I thought I had to be in the event for every minute of the event and I had to be the last person out the room. So everyone saw me, everyone actually there's something quite cool. And, um, there's, there's some benefits coming from actually being missed. I I rarely do the, I'm I'm never the last one out now. I don't drink anymore, but I'm not the last one out. I go there for the high value bits, the bits where I can add a lot of input and I don't worry about not attending a certain event or a, you know being there for a certain amount of time because what i'm super focused on is the time i am there making the most of it and it is super tiring you can't i've come off a one day event and been more exhausted than going swimming and running a marathon for the day or whatever and i know it's quite not uh, to that that extreme but it is exhausting trying to consistently add value and if you want to do it for the long term you definitely need to focus over the quality rather than uh, the quantity of it. Um, and so that exhaustion there, Jace, does that come from uh, Richard? You mentioned sort of having Richard top the brand and then you try and um, go off of an evening to go and be, you know, Richard top the individual. Um, yeah. Jason, does that, does that resonate with you in terms of the, the exhaustion comes from actually being acutely aware that you are being jason kemsley the brand right now um and so don't switch off absolutely and i i've tried for a long time to work out how to explain it and richard might have a a a cool way that that i'm yet to think of i am myself but i am acutely aware of needing to be um a better version or the best version of myself at all times, which uh, definitely means that there is an element of adrenaline or extra energy that you consume by, by delivering that particular task or that particular being a part of. Yeah. Okay. Can I um, add to that, Brad? Cause yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I'm really fascinated. And again, for anybody listening to this, you strike we're hitting on one of the keys of what i said earlier about the personal brand which is i love these conversations and i'm learning from you guys 
<laughs> and hopefully I'll learn from the audience, your community, when they get in touch. And it is a little bit like therapy, isn't it? We're sharing these things out. And what you've just said, Jason, absolutely. Because I was mulling over how it might sound to some people what we've said that, oh, well, you're not being authentic. If you are being a version of yourself when you go into these uh, events, you're not being authentic. I wouldn't say that's true. What I would say is you're trying to be the best version of yourself. And, you know, when I talked about going into a room and seeing how I could add value, seeing how I could help other people, um, you know, I was doing that because in sometimes in the IT industry especially, people can be painfully shy or introverted or painfully, um, dare I say, <laughs> not on social skills, but on that spark to actually go and have conversations. And so I felt really keenly, the almost the pressure, the weight of, okay, I know a little bit about this now. I'm going to try and make everybody else's experience that little bit better. So what you said, Jason, about, you know, being the best version of yourself, my wife came up with this. She says that, like, when I'm at events, I'm the Richard Tubb. And when I come away from events or when I'm with friends, I'm Richard Tubb. But the Richard Tubb, and there's probably a bit of the Richard Tubb who's speaking to you now, um, which is where, okay, I'm uh, listening to what people are saying. I'm trying to add value. I'm, uh, to use that spinal tap uh, uh, sort of joke thing, I'm turning the volume up to 11 here. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's the natural version of me, but I'm pushing myself with a bit more energy, with a bit more enthusiasm to try and give value to people around. So it is still authentic. I'm still being who I am. But as Jason said, it can be super tiring and you've got to be aware that A, you're being authentic and you're not trying to be something that you're not, uh, but B, that you're aware of the energy that you're expending because it will come back to hit you. It's a little bit, anybody who's spoken on stage in front of a group full of people, you have this sort of adrenaline, adrenaline rush and then you have a crash afterwards and you need to take the time to recover after the crash in the same way that maybe, I don't know, a marathon runner wouldn't immediately then go and run another uh, marathon straight afterwards they're going to take time to recover before they do it again so yeah it's very much like that brad if i can just give you a real world uh, example of that um there i was in a, a an event a scenario uh, about a month it was about a month ago now and a particular business owner or leader um asked me a question and it was around uh, his business was unfortunately losing quite an amount of money and he asked me a business related question and that individual, you know, whether I think deservedly or not sees me on this theoretical pedestal as a, a brand or a leader in the space. I knew in that very moment, he may very well take what I say and turn it into action. And I need to think that extra little bit more to make sure he's not getting in it in any way possibility not the very best of what my brain should tell him at this very moment. And so, you know, what I provided back as value or advice hopefully um, was helpful, but I'm super conscious that you never know what people are going to take from every interaction. And so you find you spend more time thinking about what you're going to say. And it is the same as what you would normally say, but you're super conscious about never, ever giving something, um, without you know plenty of thoughts or, or mind space because uh, it can mean a lot if the if the prime minister or the president was to make an off the off the shoulder comment um yes it's genuine it's them but someone could take that quite literally and i think we've seen examples of it you know i don't want to get political with u.s presidents etc they've made an off the cuff comment and people take it literally trying to be an authentic genuine personal brand you just want to make sure you never ever are giving out something that you wouldn't give out every other time. Okay. Um, I think we've um, covered an awful lot there, but um, we covered some key things that possibly work negatively for me in the sense of when I go to, to an event full of people that I know is my opportunity to build a personal brand, um, I'm, I'm possibly too dialed on in terms of worrying about making that off the cuff comment you know it's spend so much time worrying and about how do i introduce myself how do i you know become part of this wider conversation here um that possibly actually end up overthinking it um 
and that kind of stuff. So Richard, you mentioned sort of seeing the people that are, that are stood in the corner, just not wanting to communicate with people. I, I very much see myself as being um, that that individual. So um, you know, certainly, uh, hopefully, there are people resonating there, and you know, with podcasts and that sort of stuff, where you you don't have to worry about those kind of things. It's a it's a nice way in, and I think from what I've what I've seen with the two of you, it probably gets easier over time when you're when you become so I, I consider the two of you uh MSP famous is the uh is the term <laughs> that I've coined uh for it is you know you walk into a room and you know people want to meet you they want to shake your hands they want to say hi um that that obviously does that snow that snowball do I shoot? Well, if you wanted to climb a mountain every human has the capability of climbing a mountain to some degree you know whatever but you still have to train for that. You still have to practice. And the more times you climb up that mountain, the easier it gets each time. Um, I do think, Brad, you, I do, you know, I've worked with you a long time. I, I do think you have the capability of very easily doing that. You've just got to go up that mountain a few times so that actually the thought and the idea of, well, that's a long way and it's going to take me a bit of time just becomes easier and easier and it becomes a given. Um, I used to think quite a lot before I walked into any event now i have just mastered the ways of you know suppressing or you know dealing with it to feel comfortable and it's just repetition it doesn't mean it's not natural it's not um something you're more than capable of it's just those first few until you get comfortable with it that you need to you need to give yourself a little push i think um anthony middleton talks about this a lot on a podcast the um the special forces guy and he says yeah. once a year he does some extreme challenge uh, you know something super extreme and what he's doing is he's pushing his threshold higher and higher so that walking into an event feels like a you know a, a relatively easy feat in comparison to what he's already achieved um, so I, I think everyone has the capabilities they've just got to they got to push themselves so that it seems so insignificant in the grand scheme of what we all do on a week-to-week -week basis that training nice. piece that you talked about as well, something else I want to throw out there. So I mentioned that I've been blogging for, I don't know, 20 odd years. There's like five odd thousand blog posts or whatever. One of the benefits of blogging is at the start and still to this day, it doesn't matter if anybody reads it or not. That's not the point of blogging. Although, you know, if you carry on doing it consistently to one of Jason's points, you get good at it and people will start reading it, but you've got to carry on even when people don't read it. The real point of blogging or podcasting or doing videos or anything like that is to a degree, you get the repetitions. So you become more comfortable talking about the subjects that are important to you. And secondly, I found with blogging, it allows you to clarify your thoughts so there's rarely something after 20 years now of doing this where if somebody asks me a question about something in the IT industry or business building or whatever, I've probably already written a blog post about that. And by the act of writing that blog post, I've filtered my thoughts, I've clarified my thoughts, I've put the thoughts down onto paper so that I know how to explain it to other people in a better way. Does that make Absolutely. sense? So, you know, so the, the the reps that you do, Brad, don't necessarily just have to be going into a room and talking to people. If you're, but you do need to do the reps, put yourself out there. Uh, blogging is one, you know, uh, that I'd recommend to anyone. But if you're not a good writer, do videos. If you're not, uh, don't like being on camera, do audio podcasts, uh, get involved on social media, have an opinion, share it with people look to add value, look to have conversations with people. And those are repetitions. Those are reps as well. Those are walking up the mountain. And so you become really comfortable with your opinions. And so you never then spend time overthinking or rarely spend time overthinking, what am I going to say if somebody asks me this? Because you've already Absolutely. got it stored in your in your mental, uh, I was going to say file effects, in your mental database. <laughs> I'm showing my age. <laughs> No, that's a really nice way of looking at things. Um, uh, we're, we're getting into the last 10 minutes of um, of the episode now, and I feel like you guys haven't even broken a sweat there. So um, before we move on from uh, sort of the event type space, uh, do either of you care to share a story where maybe an interaction or something at an event didn't quite go so well, or maybe you felt derailed your, your journey of personal brand uh, a little bit? 
I'll, I'll, I've got a, can I share a good story first about how personal brands can really work well? And then I'll come back to the bad because I don't want people to be scared off. So I talked about, I talked about the blogging. Um, this, I had this weird situation where, so I'd been blogging for a number of years and I'd, I'd done some, I think I'd done some, maybe I hadn't done the podcast, but anyway, I'd spoken at user groups and I'd been asked to speak at an event in, uh, it was for CompTIA in Las Vegas. Now I should say, first of all, at the risk of anybody listening to this thinking, oh, Richard's always off to Las Vegas. No, I'm in Warrington one week. I'm in Newcastle upon time the next. Las Vegas is the exception, not the rule. But anyway, I'd finished this sort of presentation um and really really scared of doing public speaking i still am to this day i have sleepless nights over it that never really goes away but you just become comfortable with being uncomfortable if that makes mm -hmm. sense anyway back to the story i i did the presentation and i got in uh the, the lift uh to go up uh, the elevator uh to go up after the uh, presentation going back to my hotel room and there was this big and i mean he was like six foot six tall as well as six foot six wide there was this big american fella there and uh i could see him sort of looking at me at the corner of his eye so i sort of said hiya and he said richard hello and then he came to me and he hugged me and now i'm a hugger you both know that um you know i love i love giving and receiving hugs but it took me by surprise that this guy hugged me and i said oh forgive me i've got a really bad memory i said where do we know one another from and he said Oh, we've never met before, but I've been reading your blog for the past few years. And at that moment, it struck me. He felt as though he knew who I was from the personal brand that I was putting out there. He felt comfortable enough to hug me and have a, a conversation with a stranger in a lift, you know, uh, out of the blue. And so for me, that taught me what you are putting out there in your personal brand. People pay attention to it. And that's who people think you are. So you've got to be you've got to be careful about what you put out there, but not so careful that you're worried that you will um, not please everybody. So the bad side of things is, I've had online abuse. I've had um, people be really. Can I swear on the podcast? If you want, <laughs> I've had people be complete arseholes with me, including IT events. Because whatever they see in the personal brand that I put out there rubs them up the wrong way. But I know for every one person who might give me a hug in the, the lift, <laughs> so to speak, there are another 100 people who feel that way but weren't, haven't put their hand up and said, hey, Richard, I appreciate what you're doing. And likewise, for every person who's a complete arsehole to me who, rubs me, who I rub up the wrong way, there's going to be, you know, others who feel that way, but of course are not as nasty and will just ignore me. So you've yep. got to realize, put yourself out there. The overwhelming majority of interactions that I've had have been absolutely positive, but merely by putting your head above the parapet, merely by putting yourself out there, you are going to have some people who don't like it, but it's not about you. It's about what's going on in their head. It's about what's going on in their life. And, I have to remind myself, I'm a quite a thin-skinned guy. I'm a very emotional guy. Uh, so when I get abuse, I think, oh, what have I done wrong? Or how have I offended them? It's never to do with me. It's always to do with what's going on for them at home or in their head or anything else. So thank you for letting me lead with the nice story of the hug and then talking <laughs> about the arseholes. But uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no worries. And I, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those some of those arseholes, as you put it, um, are, are actually it comes from a, an element of jealousy. Seeing you and your personal brand and that sort of stuff is, if they can't get there themselves, actually, you know, some humans will just go and try and knock down the person that they that they're envious of, right? So yeah. uh, instead of climbing up well. to you to your level, they'll pull you down to theirs. That's I, absolutely right. Yeah, ab absolutely. Jason, what about yourself? Did you have anything? Uh, I've, I've had a few minutes to rack my brain and I don't know if you've asked this question because you know of one that I can't think of. <laughs> um, no, uh, I, don't, I haven't. I don't think I have um, had a, a really bad interaction that um, I can tell of. I, I, but there is something, there's two bad things I'd like to share that I think um, I've been to an event where I know 
in our history in the 13, 14 years, um, I, I would say we've had two people that remain in my mind that left in a sour way or a bad way and through whoever's fault that may be. I went to an event. I knew one of them was going to be there. I presented. I allowed that to affect me and I gave the worst version of myself for that event I've ever possibly had because I've done exactly what Richard has learned from, which wow. is I allowed it to personally affect me and I thought it was me and I didn't, you know, I didn't necessarily look at uh, it being them. So uh, that's something super helpful, which I'll take off and learn from. The other thing, um, which I know necessarily isn't on your question of events is uh, I think for me, there's a big neg negative of building a personal brand. And that is, uh, I, I said this to um, uh, to my fiance uh, a couple of months ago. I feel like I've perfected the uptime, Jason, but I've spent so much time, energy, and effort in doing so, I've forgotten who Jason is because Jason is, you know, uh, industry Jason, and that's how everyone knows me. And so you, you, you cross that over into your personal life sometimes. And I haven't quite, you know, I'm, I'm working on it. I think I've improved significantly and I, uh, you know, just taking up some hobbies to, to refuel that Jason. But um, you can also get lost in this. And so, you know, having someone hold you accountable, having a mentor, a therapist uh, or whatever, or surrounding yourself with good people definitely has to be a part of this journey. Um, and I wish I'd have done it much much sooner i really appreciate you both sharing i am um, i had anticipated funny funny stories about um i don't know tripping over and uh, making a fool of yourself or something so um but i really appreciate you sort of sharing actually some of the some of the negative emotions that once you've had some success at building personal brand can um can come and affect you so um, it's really nice um to to talk through those thank you um i've got two questions before we finish up so the first one I think is probably something that many, many people experience. I know that we've experienced it when launching a, a previous podcast um, and it's the need to provide value. Um, certainly I like everything that I do to be providing value to the people that are watching it. When you're doing, you know, these days, I think you've got to do about two, ep two episodes, podcast episodes a week to, to really get up the rankings and that sort of stuff. You really got to put stuff out there. Um, what, how have you overcome this need to provide to value and maybe get into some of the lighter stuff that certainly someone's going to find value out of, but maybe it doesn't, it's not quite as hard hitting as a subject. Um, that doesn't, I guess what I'm after is it doesn't sit well with me. I don't want to be seen as the guy that's talking about the stuff that is like, well, duh, how, yep. how, do, you, how do you overcome that stuff? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm su I can be super quick on this one. Everything is value. Not everyone finds everything that we find easy. Um, easy. Some people find things easy that I find complex. Um, if you are authentic, if you have good intent, even the things that you think are not valuable will be valuable to someone. Yeah. Simple. I would go a step further even and to your point about, oh, I don't want to be talking about things that like everybody's going to go, duh. I can't, I don't know who did the, who said the quote, but to paraphrase it, everything that could, can be said has been said, but thankfully nobody was listening, <laughs> 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 which is true. Think about now, you know, to, to take the humor out of that for a for a moment, every time I got that fear of, oh, am I sharing stuff that is bloody obvious to other people probably but that's part of the curse of knowledge so you're a very smart guy uh brad same for you jason you know so there can be that tendency to go well everybody knows that so firstly to jason's point no everybody doesn't know that and secondly sometimes have you ever had the situation where somebody's giving you a piece of advice no actually it's going to be your partner your life partner is going to have given you some piece of advice and you hear it but you don't act upon it. And then you go and see a, a GP, a doctor, a consultant, a business advisor, a mentor. They give you the exact same piece of advice and you, in, you go and use it. And of course, then you come home to your wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, husband who goes, I told you that. You never bloody listen to me. <laughs> it happens all the time. So everything that you might want to say, you should say, 
because somebody is going to listen to you and your voice and your personal brand where they may not hear what somebody else has got to say on exactly the same topic. So don't worry if, you know, there's loads of information out about that. You've not said it at the moment. So put it out with your personal brand. And, you know, the worst that's going to happen is somebody looks at it and goes, "Eh, yeah, I've heard that from other people and move on. I can tell you though, every week, every day, I get emails and lovely messages from people on LinkedIn and things, which is, again, really good for my ego, really flattering, uh, good for my self-esteem, saying thank you. And some of, for, for a blog post, a podcast, a video, some of them are like 10, 15 years old, these videos, and I've forgotten I've even done them. And somebody says, well, thank you for that. Thank you for putting it out there. So I would encourage you to overcome that fear of, uh, uh, you know, somebody else has already said it. So, And also going back to Richard's point, Brad, if if – if someone looked at it and went, well, oh, that's not that's not of huge value. That's kind of their problem, not yours. Yeah. It's providing value to someone. Fantastic. And so let's move on to the final question then. So we're overcoming the the problem of of value creation, or maybe we've we've whizzed through those early ideas that you're gonna you're gonna put out there. That might be in a podcast, LinkedIn articles, uh, posts, that kind of thing. Where where do you guys go? Um, shopping searching for uh, for new ideas that you're going to put out there to to grow that personal brand and keep present oh i can jump in jason because yeah you might have I, to they're everywhere everywhere so on a technical level i get a bit geeky uh, here i carry notepads around with me i carry something called a rocket book which you can write in and then rub off and stuff um i uh, i use um something called nimbus notes you could use evernote or OneNote. i've got a note in there with blog ideas with article ideas with book ideas video ideas when these things come up even if i just scribble it on my physical notepad and then scan it into the computer afterwards Ideas are everywhere all around you. I've had a dozen ideas just from this conversation that we've had here. It's like, oh, I've never spoken about that or I've never elaborated upon that. So content is once you get started with it, there is tons and tons and tons of it just floating around, uh, you know, uh, there. Uh, so th- that's the the big thing for me is making a note of it and then revisiting those notes quite often and you know i I, we work in the msp industry when msps come to me and they say i I couldn't start a blog or a podcast or a video series or anything because we've got nothing to talk about i say okay tell me three conversations you've had with clients today oh well they asked about as you were this and they asked about sharepoint that and and i'm like right there you go If they're asking about it, somebody else is going to be wanting to know about it. So write a blog post, do a short video, or even if you're not sure what to write about, share your journey of not being sure what to write about because other people are not sure what to write about and they will take inspiration from your journey there. So hopefully I'm I'm not laboring the point too much, but the ideas are absolutely everywhere. Capture them, act upon them, and you will have an infinite source of content. Fantastic! Absolutely. I um uh, for the first time in the podcast, I have I have some some value to add here. <laughs> so um, I I more recently in um you know getting set up, I anticipated that with the new podcast, well, we're going to probably run out of ideas, um, and so I've started blocking out just an hour on a Friday when it's a bit quieter to just go in search of ideas. As you said, Richard, everything that can be said has been said. So it's about taking ideas and inspiration. So this this last Friday, I um, I turned around to my bookcase and I went through and it, it's about taking from someone else's ideas and, and maybe updating them, um, reinvigorating them or putting your own spin on some things. Um, so yeah, ab- absolutely. Just in your bookcase at, at, at home there, you can pick up some books and uh, and find some new ideas and some things to to talk about for sure. It's a brilliant idea. And Bill Gates, doesn't he? He famously uh, goes away for a week every year to his log cabin you know, in the middle of nowhere with a monster pile of books. And he's got no connectivity. He just sits there and he absorb, ab- absorbs books and comes up with a ton of ideas. Some of them have been multi-million, multi-billion pound ideas that he's come back with. I think what you've just said there is incredible value for anybody listening. You need to make the time to think 
you need to make the time to be inspired. And we're yep. moving so very quickly, so quickly now that it's difficult. And, you know, you've said this is the first time I've added value in this podcast. That's really untrue because by starting this podcast, there are going to be people who are listening to this podcast, are taking the time out, and you are, I guarantee, going to inspire them with some ideas of their own. So you've added at least two pieces of value here, Brad. I think you've both covered it all. And the only thing I would add is is learn yourself and when your creative energy is at its best so that you can harness that. I know at night my brain is ticking. So that's when I take, you know, I review my notes or um take my notes down most often uh because i've recognized as you know richard has recognized he sees ideas all day and then um they probably turn into the fully flourish product at uh, a certain period it's just work out when you are most creative um sometimes that's in the shower uh sometimes that's when i'm in the gym and so uh then adapt the things around it so i've always got my one note uh on my phone next to me to just capture those down and i then polish them later on I'll buy you some bath chalk, Jason, so that when you get your shower ideas, you can just pop them on the uh, pop them on the wall there. I, I saw a notepad the other day. I think it was called Aqua Notes. Have you guys come across this? And it's literally like it's like um, a pencil that what I was going to say works underwater. I think every pencil does, but you get the idea. And a, and a notepad <laughs> that you just stick in the shower and you can write on it, and it doesn't get washed away. I was like, that's brilliant. <laughs> but now I've got uh, it really I've got is. An, you, you've got one already, have you, Jason? Or? No, I'm just I'm just writing it down. Oh, there you go. I was going to say, but most of us have got uh, an AI assistant sitting around the home now. I was going to say her name, but then she'd start to chirp in. And I've got one in the bathroom as well. So I can actually shout out her name and say, add something to my to-do list or add something to my Evernote. So there you go. That's the geeky way of doing it. We had to bring some geekiness in right at the end here. For sure, for sure. Thank you so much for that. Um, great. Right. Well, then uh, let's wrap up. Jason, uh, thank you for being guest on your own podcast. Uh, <laughs> appreciate that. Your contact details are, are obviously going to be um, in, in the show notes anyway. For those of you on YouTube, I apologize for my camera issues that have plagued me throughout this recording. Uh, Did Richard, you say you were in the tech space, Brad, just to clarify? Yeah, I fixed it super <laughs> quick whilst on the video. Uh, <laughs> Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Where can our, our listeners and our viewers um, find you on the web? Yeah, they can find me everywhere, unfortunately. But if you just do a search, Google search, Bing search for uh, Richard Tubb, T-U-B-B, MSP, you will find all of my stuff. But my podcast is Tub Talk, the podcast for IT consultants. If you're not sit of uh, listening to me already there's hundreds of odd episodes of me talking to some of the smartest people in the industry and then me <laughs> perfect stuff well we really appreciate your time richard thanks for coming on My pleasure. and for everyone else we'll see you on the next episode <laughs>